you at the heart for that very good overview of what sustainability means also for manufacturers and retailers, because this morning we were talking more about producers. Um, now what we want to do is we want to go back to producers. Uh, we want to introduce Jacques Gustav who is a executive director of the jewelry company that's based in the Philippines and produces golden pearls. And he's going to be talking about that. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real honor and a real pleasure to be here with um, such distinguished members of the industry. Um, although I stand here alone right now, I represent um, you know, the rest of uh, our family and the pearl farmers as well as um, our colleagues, some of them are here. And um, I hope I can give justice to the dedication and passion that they do. Mm -hmm. So, First, I'm going to give a brief introduction of what, what Joomer is. Um, so Joomer is a fully vertically integrated um, company, meaning we handle, we have our own pearl farms, we have our own um, distribution, we have our own jewelry manufacturing, and we have our own retail stores. So we're present at all levels of the industry. Now, um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to what is Pearl Farm. Um, but before that, I'd like to um, also mention that in today's uh, pearl industry, probably the most prominent um, pearl producing brands are uh, Bass Valley in Australia, Robert One in Tahiti, and uh, us in the Philippines. Um, this is also in terms of marketing and uh, education that we're trying to provide to the Essentially, pearl farming is about man working in symbiosis with nature to create the world's only living gem. Um, yeah, to create the world's only living gem from a living organism. Uh, we like to say we're in a joint venture with nature, um, which is very complicated because nature has 51%, so basically we don't have any power of decision. <laughs> um, it is a quest for perfection that's rarely achieved, um, but we all think we know how to get there, and we try every time. Sometimes we get there, but most of the time we don't. And of course, um, it comes with the unwavering faith in the creation of a beautiful organic gem. I just want to um, quote Douglas a while ago when he was saying when he's operating on his oysters, he uses uh, the force. <laughs> okay. Now, um, for us, modern pearl farming has three very important factors. First is human. Uh, not in any order of importance, but all equally important, I would say. Uh, human, the environment, and of course, the shell. We've identified that from the hatchery process, um, the humans come in contact with the oyster about 320 feet times until the time of harvest. Um, What's the underlying philosophy in everything that we do, whether it's the relationship with nature, the relationship with the communities, the relationship among the people in the farms, and even the relationship with the oysters, and the TLC philosophy, which stands for tender love and care. And of course, the perfect pearl philosophy, which means that we start with something perfect, which is the nucleus, which is perfectly round, perfectly smooth, that we um, implant to the oyster. And then we have to try to maintain that perfection for three years, although most of the time we never, we never actually achieve it. Now, I'm going to talk about the hatchery so you can understand how sensitive this oyster is and how it is important that we take care of the environment and what this organism is actually about. So we actually moved from an extractive model uh, to a non-extractive model, which means that we don't um, get uh, oysters from the natural beds, first of all, because they've been depleted in the early 1900s. I'm talking just in the Philippines. Um, another factor is also it's in a very um, dangerous zone um, in terms of uh, pirates. Uh, and uh, also it's very difficult to control the quality of the oysters. So to, to develop the hatchery, it actually took 20 years of research and development. Um, the most challenging part, I think, well, there's several factors, determining the sex of the oyster. Um, it didn't make it easier that they're hermaphrodites, so they can change between male and female. Um, 
the second thing is that finding out in a controlled environment, you know, what food do they actually eat? So we've identified there's over 50,000 different types of phytoplankton in, um, in the Philippine seas. And uh, these oysters are very, very selective and I think they eat only something around uh, 10. And that's a big sign. Um, so it was very difficult to find out what those 10 were, and that's what took 20 years. Um, so we have, now we have a way to supply the best oysters for our pro production. We found the ideal food. And we were also able to narrow um, the type of oyster to the golden oyster. Because the golden oyster in the wild, you probably only find one out of a thousand that will have the golden characteristic. And we were able to breed those oysters to be able to produce them. And in the wild, the survival rate is, I think, less than 0.01%. But um, with our TLC philosophy and um, the care that everybody in the farm takes to the oysters, as well as the health of the environment, <coughs> we've reached a survival rate of about 5%. So what exactly is the ideal location for a pro farm in the Philippines? So we have that favorable sea conditions. Um, this means proper current flow. Uh, it also means that we have to have the right amount of plankton, micro elements, um, and uh, the right depth, the right type of water, many, many different factors which are different in other growth producing countries. We need fresh water, believe it or not, not every single island has fresh water. So for some of our farms, the cost of fresh water actually is the same price as a liter of diesel because we have to bring it to the island. Um, and also, it has to be protected from typhoons, or at least we thought so, because now the typhoon belt is moving, it's much wider than it used to be. By protecting the natural habitat of oysters, pearl farms also become the breeding grounds of the diverse group of marine life. Um, I won't go into more detail in that because I think Ken Carpenter explained it quite well. Um, what you're seeing here on the right picture is a school of fish under a bamboo raft where we hold the nets. Um, so you can really see how much fish um, this attracts. And this is not uh, something that happens once in a while, this is every day. Um, what you see here on the left happens more rarely. Uh, that's a whale shark swimming in between the lines. Um, the great thing about that shot is uh, our little friend there decided to show off just when National Geographic was going to shoot it over. So, uh, and, you know, I, I, I have a lot of uh, thanks to pay. Usually, whale sharks show up in very pristine environments where there's the, where the waters are fine and rich. Now, the harvest. The harvest is all about timing. Um, we've identified that the oyster lays about five to seven layers of nature every day. So any changes in the environment will affect um, this ability of oysters to build layers. So from week to week, we can notice some differences in the pearls. So the timing of the harvest and the environmental conditions of when we harvest is uh, extremely important. It's about patience because you never know what you're going to get. You're working at something for five years and uh, you won't know until you actually see it, what the result of that is. Um, Although we are trying to produce gold pearls, only 30% or less will be dark champagne to gold. We'll also have rejects and, in some ways, there's no pearls. But you might also have the occasional check. Um, just to make it clear, the process is about five years uh, from hatchery all the way to harvest for a single pearl. Now, if you factor in the second operation for the larger pearls, meaning 14 millimeter up, um, then you're coming close to 70. Okay, so what are the direct impacts of pearl farming that, that we've seen uh, in the Philippines? So as Ken mentioned, there's the artificial reef effect because of all those baskets hanging at a certain depth. Um, they create uh, small communities of fish and other organisms. Uh, we call them biogenerators. Having a pearl farm also increases um, the food quantity in that area for the whole chain because um, the, oyster, the oysters, when they breed, they have, there's a lot of uh, spat in the water, which a lot of organisms eat. 
but also from the fouling on the nets, fish eat that as well. Um, so really the the availability of food in a pearl farm is very, very rich for, for all marine life. Um, we also protect the corals through these marine protected zones. Um, we don't have a UNESCO biosphere yet, but uh, some of the protected zones are recognized by the Philippine government. And also we have to protect the forests because um, because of the proximity of the pearl farms to land. Um, with some communities who do slash and burn farming, uh, it might work for a white crop, but then when the rainy season comes, all the topsoil, um, you know, washes into the sea and then, then uh, suffocates all the coral. So we have to also educate the communities about um, protecting the coral. What are our immediate threats that we're already facing is acidification, the um, carbon dioxide parts per million in the water has increased drastically um, in the last couple of years. Uh, I would say between five to 10 years ago, we were probably at 280 parts per million, and now we're at 350 parts per million. And we've identified that, I think, at 450, um, oysters would not be able to grow because the water would be too acidic. So we might not be able to produce pearls then, and that's not so bad if people can't wear pearl jewelry. But along with that, um, we will lose many other things as well as humans. The temperature, um, we're seeing sustained temperatures, both lows and highs, much longer periods. Now our oyster is also very uh, very spoiled in, the, in terms of temperature because it only likes to live between 27 and 32 degrees. Um, when it gets to 26 degrees, it's too cold for them, and then 32 degrees for a longer period of time. It's too long. And they get heat. Uh, deforestation, as I mentioned, and of course, uh, pollution from, uh, from uh, well, human, human development of communities. What are the specific sustainable activities we do? We have marine protected zones. We use solar energy for some functions, such as water pumps, freezers, water heaters, um, and a few other small appliances. Uh, we have many alternative livelihood projects, which I won't go into. This, uh, I won't go into a discussion about because I have a video to show, um, as well as uh, okay, so as well as education, uh, medical, and uh, we are also deputized coast guard, so we can we have the power to protect um, and save people. Um, strategy. In terms of our sustainability, we have a very targeted approach by family. So we're work, we're not trying to have a shotgun approach. We're just we're just sending out the message, and then hopefully they'll do something. We work really closely with one family, and then when they see when other families see that how it's working for them, then they replicate it. And then when you see that on a community scale, um, that then of course is exponential. We're trying to raise awareness through the sale of pearls. Every pearl we sell, we try to tell the story and the origin and everything that's involved behind it. And all of our sustainable projects are funded by the sale of <coughs> pearls, so we don't have any external funding. So I just want to put that number in mind because one thing we haven't mentioned is actually how rare are these pearls. So 7,000 is not only close to the number of islands we have in the Philippines, 7,701, but that number is also the amount of brown, golden, and clean uh, South Sea pearls we produce in the Philippines on the, in a year. So eight, brown, gold, that's a very small number. So we say actually uh, the owner doesn't uh, choose to buy, culture, uh, to buy a golden South Sea pearl, it's the golden South Sea pearl that chooses you. Um, I just want to show this because this is a cross-section of the oyster. Um, so you can actually see the different environmental uh, challenges that this oyster has faced. Um, we've been able to link that the darker color the oyster can produce in terms of gold, the healthier it is. So when we see any changes um, in that cross-section, we can identify what had happened. If there was a storm, if there was a typhoon, if the oysters had a weakening, etc. So we can kind of say that the pearl is an indicator of the health of the environment. 
And um, in fact, when that oyster is carrying the pearl, if you do a cross section of that pearl and match it to the oyster, it tells the same story. Mm -hmm. So in effect, people plan pearls. Um, and have one without the other in terms of culture pearls. And um, also for we have we have to make sure that uh, well I always we always say that the pearls are the reward. We have to the only thing we can really do is take care of the environment and take care of the people around. And perhaps if we do that well, then we might produce nice pearls. But if not, there's no chance. Um, so I just want to end with some pictures. Uh, this is uh, we were, uh, the Philippine South Sea Pearl and the 1,000 Vessel Bill. This is a new bill that has just come out, I think, two years ago. So we were able to, uh, to have that there to raise awareness about the importance of the national gem of the Philippines. Um, and that's, that's going to the office in the morning. <laughs> that's the office. Uh, this is what I'm talking about, the artificial reef effect. Um, this is during the last typhoon, um, which actually wipes out the whole infrastructure onto our farm. So the global, well, our, our global production of uh, golden South Sea is actually going to drop a further 20% as a result of that. Um, but uh, it was a very uh, traumatizing experience for us. Um, that's a cement point. Um, so that's what a building kind of looks like when you get hit by 300 kilometer per hour winds. Um, it's actually that the one that came off quite well because the other buildings are just not even there anymore. But we're trying to rebuild. Uh, in fact, just last week, uh, after the typhoon, a lot of the pro farmers' families um, had lost their homes. And uh, we then launched a program to help them rebuild their homes. So as of last week, we've already rebuilt 407 houses um, for those families. Um, again, this is the resiliency of the Filipino spirit. Uh, this is, yeah, after the typhoon, we flew right there to make sure uh, the people were okay. We didn't care so much about the infrastructure, but as long as they still had that fighting spirit, we knew we could rebuild. Um, and that's it. Thank you. I know it's, I know I'm running close on time, but if I can hear us. We're at 20 minutes, but I don't know if we're going to use point all the way. That's five minutes, if that's okay. with 
confinement is constantly renewed, particularly within the confines of the pearl farms. A steady and impulsive life that silently flops, as it is patiently cultivated and harbored within an environmentally protected zone. Outside the zone, however, a different story unfolds. Here, the sudden sound of devastation is catching fire. Lays it once burned forests into new patches of land. Sure. 